as of January 2018, anyone over the age of 21 can walk into a store in California and pick up some marijuana. All you need is some cash or a credit card. To learn more about how legalized recreational cannabis sales work, we tracked a product up the supply chain from seed to sale. We talked to cannabis entrepreneurs along the way to find out what's changed for them operating in a legal state market. And what we found was surprising. Excitement, yes, but also anxiety about the future of the legal market under California's highly regulated and highly taxed system. And industry insiders told us that if the legal market remains so overtaxed and overregulated, the black market will continue to stay in business. The story ends with the sale of the Kiva Bar, the product of a company run by a husband and wife team who began working out of their Oakland kitchen. But let's start at the beginning, about 100 miles away at Riverview Farms, which two years ago converted from poinsettias to pot. It's been a family-owned business for 20 years with daughter Michelle Hackett currently serving as president. This is the agricultural capital of the world. Fresh vegetables come out of this growing region. We also have great Pinot Noir grapes coming out of this region. There's no reason why cannabis shouldn't be cultivated here. Hackett is excited for the future of the market, but under immense pressure from the increased regulation and taxation that kicked in at the beginning of the year. Riverview holds 16 separate cultivation licenses to grow this amount of cannabis, as well as two distribution licenses to transport medical and recreational cannabis to retailers and manufacturers. They pay a harvest tax of $9.25 per dry weight ounce of cannabis flour that enters the commercial market. Hackett says that compliance costs have driven up prices across the state. I think it's greed. People are looking for a handout and are thinking that we're weed people, we must be waking all this money, but really we're running this like a farm or a, another agricultural operation in the same community wanting to be treated the same. The greenhouses here hold plants at all stages of development, culminating in mature plants ready for harvest every two to four weeks. Then workers hang the cannabis to dry before it's ready to be cut and sent to market. But Hackett says that while business was booming in the era of medical cannabis legalization, strict licensure requirements have shrunk her customer base significantly since recreational legalization went into effect. We have to protect our license, so the only business we want to do is with other licensed retailers, distributors, delivery services. In the past, you had a customer list of, say, maybe 300. Right now, maybe you're working with 50. It's the green boom, and people are wanting to jump on the bandwagon and see if they can profit from this industry, but I think what people will realize is that it takes a lot of work. <laughs> Our next stop is Kiva's manufacturing facility in Oakland, a chocolate factory with one extra ingredient. People want a product they can trust and rely on. And so in the sort of gray market of California, we were really able to stand out by producing something that was clean and consistent every single time. Edible marijuana has provoked media stories of hospitalizations and meltdowns, with New York Times columnist Maureen Dowd once penning a column about the time she ate cannabis-infused chocolate and freaked out in a Colorado hotel room shortly after legalization. But Kiva bars are hand-packaged into distinctive wrappers that foreground the psychoactive THC content in big, bold numbers so that users know exactly how much they're consuming with each bite. The packaging and labeling on Kiva products is extremely important. We treat every package essentially like a billboard. The education process around cannabis and consumers learning dosing is going to take a while until people have the same familiarity with cannabis dosing as they do with alcohol, for example. Knobloch Palmer says that although the customer base for marijuana has increased tenfold since recreational legalization, that the increased taxes and regulation have forced the company to make layoffs in recent months. The situation in the market right now is pretty dire. Right now there's a few hundred licenses. In 2017 there were maybe 20 to 30,000 operators. So we've seen a significant drop in the number of people allowed to operate in the market. Taxes are a big component of the new market. There are essentially four times that the cannabis is taxed. It's surprising that with the legal market in California that companies are experiencing less volume and less demand. And that has everything to do with the cost 
of cannabis, the price of cannabis to the end consumer. Our company has unfortunately had to do a layoff for the first time in our company's history. We were all really excited and kind of promised a really healthy, robust cannabis marketplace. We're all sort of hanging on for our lives. Nablak Palmer says she's still optimistic about the future of the industry, but that some major reforms still need to happen in order for a legal market to outcompete the black market. The end consumer is walking into a regulated store and seeing prices up here, and then they're um, walking into an unregulated store or they're calling their guy and they're seeing prices down here. So the unregulated market really has the potential to derail the entire system because it's undercutting all the legal operators at every opportunity. Our next stop is at Farm Labs, a testing facility in Long Beach. Before legal weed makes it to market in California, the new law requires testing for purity and potency, often several times if the cannabis is part of a manufactured product. It's one of many cannabis labs that existed long before the state required testing since many companies such as Kiva underwent voluntary testing as a way to set their products apart from the competition. The states don't have enough resources to provide testing services. I think we're really filling a gap, these labs that have been here from the beginning. Dr. Robert Brodnick is the research director at this lab and has a background in counter-narcotics at the Department of Defense. He says his mind changed when he saw that cannabis could be a less harmful alternative to other drugs. Cannabis is a potential way to mitigate or offset some of the, the, the dangers of opioid abuse. This view is in stark contrast to that of Attorney General Jeff Sessions, who buys into the marijuana as gateway drug argument. Heroin addiction starts with prescription. We think a lot of this is starting with marijuana and other drugs, too. Studies are still limited, but preliminary data do show that states with legal marijuana tend to have lower rates of opioid addiction and overdose deaths. And while testing should make cannabis products even safer for consumers, Magdoff worries that California's testing standards are a little too stringent. I think it's going to be a rough start for California with the amount of products that are they're going to fail. The pesticide thresholds are very stringent here. Cannabis is the most tested agricultural commodity at this point. For the California cannabis industry to be successful, there needs to be kind of a middle ground. The final destination is, of course, the storefront, known for years in California as the dispensary. We visited a green alternative in San Diego, just minutes from the border and, ironically, down the road from the Drug Enforcement Administration offices. The store counts Kiva as one of its top sellers, and owner Zachary Lazarus says he's seen a definite spike in sales post-recreational legalization. The difference between operating medicinally versus recreationally is you have a plethora of people that have come out of the woodwork, that have come out of the closet, that have, are so happy to be able to consume cannabis, cannabis for the first time or to relook at it since their college or high school days. But like the other business owners we spoke with, he said regulations are still too tight, taxes too high, and worries that local governments are too involved in picking winners and losers in the market with the licensing system. It seems like a, there's a lot of barriers to entry right now, but that doesn't have to be that way. Yes, we need strict compliance, so we need accountability, but we also need to give all those mom and pop shop owners a, a, an opportunity, a chance to give back with taxation, a chance to grow jobs, and a chance to really contribute to the cannabis community. And like everyone in the cannabis industry, Lazarus still lives under the dark cloud of federal prohibition. Stores like his still have trouble even opening bank accounts. We don't have a fair shake when it comes to being able to transact and do it above board like everybody else. Issues with the banking system and fear of federal crackdowns were a consistent theme every step of the way. It's scary, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It's a huge issue for us in terms of banking. Having us federally legal would take a huge you know, weight off my shoulder. Cannabis being illegal at the federal level is certainly a challenge that the industry thinks about on a daily basis. Um, it's a natural governor to the growth potential of the industry. The words coming out of Jeff Sessions' mouth, to me, is like the words coming out of Anslinger's mouth back in the 1930s. You have a lot of criticism and you have a lot of ignorance 
that really doesn't understand an industry. When you don't understand something, you tend to criticize it. But despite lingering uncertainty, everyone along the supply chain remained optimistic that there will be regulatory reforms in California and eventual legalization nationwide. The cat's out of the bag. More people in this country live in a state with some type of cannabis regulation now. So I really feel there's no going back. It's not going away, so they might as well regulate it and capitalize on the tax money. The whole state really wants this. With 37 and a half million people in our state, you really can't go backwards. I mean, that's just reality. California's going to a recreational market is a huge win for the industry, for the cannabis plant overall. It will really help cannabis become more mainstream, allow more people to have access to it, and really further the movement in a way that we probably have never seen before.